Welcome into the DNVR Rockies podcast brought to you by Strava Craft Coffee. It can now be delivered to your doorstep every two, four, six, or eight weeks. You get 20% off with that feature. Or if you just want a bag of that CBD infused, CBD rich Strava Craft Coffee, use code DNVR25 at StravaCraftCoffee.com. I am your host, Patrick Lyons. As he does every week, the voice of the Colorado Rockies for AT&T Sportsnet. Host of the Drew Goodman podcast is our buddy Drew Goodman. What's going on, Patrick? How you doing, my man? We're doing okay. We're doing okay. We we might not have a CBA, but baseball feels like it's getting to be somewhat normal. We're seeing some some guys down in spring training. We're seeing players in purple, players that we know, some prospects, and so that's somewhat comforting at this time. Yeah, and as you know, as we uh, do this show late in the morning on Wednesday. You and I are both monitoring by the minute, literally, um, you know, what's going on in New York. They seem like, and I'm very cautious because uh, a week ago, it seemed like when they were both down in Florida that they were going to get a deal done. Similar scenario. They negotiated into the wee hours of the morning and you figured they were going to get up the next morning and, and you know, kind of cross the T's, dot the I's, so to speak. And that didn't happen, as we know. Now they've made you know, more strides. It seems like it's on the precipice of, of coming to an agreement. But with these two factions, I don't think you can ever uh, count it as a done deal until you hear <laughs> that it's a done deal. But, uh, you know, very cautiously, very cautiously optimistic. It is. I, I thought that after last week, we were going to have maybe a month of just, just a deadlock where – both sides maybe didn't want to make an offer. It was, you know, there's rumblings of eh, baseball might come back late May, early June. I mean, I had originally predicted at the beginning of the off season in, in November, December, March 14th would be when this deal gets signed. And so it's looking really good for that now. But overall, as you said, there's been progress, which is, is positive. You still don't know exactly how far apart they are with, with each side. If, if there's going to be those tweaks that hold things up, but there's been progress. There's been optimism, and that that's certainly positive. Yeah, and, and without seeing how it all plays out, first of all, congratulations because you know you, you may end up being almost right on the date. Uh, I hope you're just a little bit short because you know Same. the 14th is what five days away or something like that. We don't want yeah, that. But it's Monday. I figured I figured Monday would be a would be a day after working all yeah. throughout the weekend. A Monday morning, drop that that memo, that press release, boom, let's get going. I feel like that's yeah. a good time frame too. There, there have been many times like you though, I've been pessimistic and felt like, you know, this thing may not start for months. And and uh I'm incredulous at the fact that we're, we are where we are right now, much less the possibility that they were going to miss and, and still might, right? Miss a, a multitude of games. To me, it's unfathomable given uh, the, the amount of money that's being split up, close to $11 billion, and where we are, all the things we've talked about, where we are as a society, where we are, you know, where baseball is on the landscape. So, you know what, uh, um, fingers crossed, like, like anybody who cares about the game, that uh, you know, you and I will be chatting uh, later about. Okay, it's finally done. That sort of thing. Um, th there's been big movement though from a week ago. Not to get into the minutia, I'm yeah. just kind of regurgitating you know stuff I've read. But you know, uh, I think a week ago the the owners were still at like 220 million on the CBT, and they've come up 10 million dollars. The the they they've more than met the halfway point because I think the the players' association was at 238 in year one. So you know, in, in the minimum salary, 570 to 700 escalating from there. It does appear, and I don't have a dog in the fight. I just want to see the damn thing done. But it does appear the owners have made um, quite a bit of movement in the direction of, of the players uh, this time around. So, you know, again, fingers crossed. I thought the CBT was going to be the biggest sticking issue for the players to get changed, and that being – possibly the the area to focus on most because you know minimum salaries were going to come up they had agreed to a pre-arbitration pool maybe it wasn't going to be as high as they would have liked so really that effort has to focus more on the cbt or even as you mentioned last week a salary floor something with that and so again 
the owners have come up from that. That's positive. One of the other interesting wrinkles that has now come out and just curious of your take is this idea of an international draft. It's been long something that MLB has kind of dreamed of and, you know, put out there in various ways. I, I don't think this would be anything that would start anytime soon. I, I think one of the, again, alleged things that has been thrown out there is like it wouldn't even start before 2024. So we'd have a, a little bit of a build up to that. But just curious, what has been your early takes on an international draft? Well, I, I, that may be a, a bit of a give back, too, because I don't know how long it would take to implement it. But, uh, you know, I'm sure the owners saying, all right, we're going to wait till 2024, some sort of a give back because the players not I don't want to say you, uh, there, there's unanimity on this. Um, I, I think there's some players from Latin America who think it would be good. And there's a lot of players who think it would would not necessarily be good. But there's a lot of underhanded shenanigans that have taken place for generations in Latin America. Major League Baseball's done, you know, a fair amount already to 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 deal with that, where there's spending limits and and there's international signing pools. So one team can't just, you know, out spend completely outspend another team i don't from my standpoint i don't know why a an international draft would be you know such a, a a controversial thing it seems fair you know the first pick in the draft they're proposing would would be at 5.5 million or something i mean it would, it would pretty much mirror what we see here a 20 round draft in in north america and it would be a 20 round draft from what i've read internationally and again i i don't see why that should be such a huge sticking point uh, but everything is utilized as a uh, you know as a negotiating tool so it, it's like the dh <laughs> the 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 players wanted the dh the owners wanted the dh but the players were withholding that saying okay if we give this to you we need something in return and and so the international draft, they have, they have to they have to level the playing field. They've, they've made strides in that regard, but they have to get rid of, um, you know, some of the things that were taking place under the table. Uh, you know, who knows, team scouts getting paid off. You've heard rumors of that, that kind of thing. Um, but, to, you know, to make it, you know, okay, if this young 16-year-old kid or whatever is the – the top prospect and and whatever team picks first, he has, you know, they, they can draft that player. So um, I don't know. I don't know enough about uh, right. how it would affect. I, I, I'm going to probably make a phone call to Rolando Fernandez, who's run uh, Latin American operations for the Rockies for years and is very well respected down there universally, not just in the Rockies organization to find out, you know, his take on it. It's, it's, it's fascinating, right? Because as you said, for everything that we do know about him, as much we could speculate, and you look at the numbers, as you said, 5.5 million for the first overall pick. So I think that's that slots in as the, the seventh highest prospect in, in this last draft. So, you know, somewhat similar. Uh, you can make, I don't know that that's controversial, but you say, oh, well, they could, they could very easily be the same price. The, the, the slots could be the same in the international market as it is uh, here in, in America. We could get to that point. Yeah, I don't, that would be fine. I don't, I, yeah, I didn't understand that. Why I, yeah. I heard the same thing you did. That it would be. I don't know why it wouldn't be exactly the same. I right. Mean, that, that's and I suppose there's got to be some reasoning as to why it wasn't quite dollar for dollar. But who knows? You know, maybe it's because if the draft, if you can draft sixteen year olds, maybe it's for that reason as opposed to you know North America, you have to be eighteen. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. That, that again, interesting wrinkle there. There's a lot to unpack because we don't have all the details. The one thing that, again, that has been floated that's very in, enticing is the fact that you could actually trade these picks. And that's where, you know, that, that could be just, just fascinating all the different possibilities that you could have with something like that. Even if it's just the matter of, you know, trading two players straight up one for one and one team is just, little bit hesitant in in making that deal and saying yes well what if you throw me a a 15th round international draft pick that could be enough to move a needle so it's just just a fun concept in general to to think about yeah uh, i think one of the fascinations 
among many with the NFL draft because right. college football is so closely followed. So you're aware, especially in the early rounds of, oh, yeah, I watched that guy play a couple times on TV when he was at Auburn. And now he's coming to my team. I liked it, whatever. Um, and also the fact that, you know, the Dallas Cowboys have moved down 10 slots and traded their pick to the, you know, San Francisco 49ers. And so to have some of that, I think would allow, you know, would, would you know, add uh, some, some juice to major league baseball's draft of which most people have had never heard unless you're a baseball nerd like us haven't heard of these guys at all what's also interesting about it and maybe this is something that needs to come to the the mlb draft is there's not going to be any real rhyme or reason for picks one through 30 they're basically going to group the teams sort of in a bundle of six and you're just going to rotate through and every five years you'll be in the top six picks. And so it, it won't be based on win loss record. You won't need to do any tanking, do anything like that. Uh, that's, that's again, just kind of interesting and we'll see how that shakes out and maybe it makes it a little bit more fair and, and equitable, but uh, I like the overall concept of it. And, uh, and as, as you started off by saying, maybe it brings a little more decency you know, back to the, that international market and there's less nefarious things and underhanded deals going on behind the doors. That will always be the case, you know, in any industry, in any capacity, but maybe it certainly tamps down on that in a, in a major way. Well, I go back to something we were discussing earlier there. Whenever these deals are done and it seems in baseball, there there's more of what I'm about to say. And that is, you don't know the exact consequences of, of how certain things will play out. You know, I think oftentimes you're doing guesswork, educated guesswork and saying, well, if we raise the, in the, let's say we raise the CBT and we get it in the 230, $240 million range, then it's going to raise the bar for all players. And you're going to see more middle class players instead of making 8 million a year, they're going to start making, you know, 25% more on a deal. Yet sometimes other things happen and you don't know until you it's actually in place and practiced by teams. And maybe you price out some people in the middle class, for instance, I'm, I'm trying to put together a hypothetical here. So you really don't know the consequences of all of these different changes until it plays out over a period of time. You know, sometimes one side goes back and goes, man, this played out completely differently than I thought it was going to be. Uh, wasn't good for our side, or maybe it's really good for our side. You just don't know. It's a definite butterfly effect happening where, mm -hmm. as you said, you, you don't know. But what you do know is you're going to have a great time when you come on down to the DNVR bar on the corner of Colfax in New York for any of our watch parties, oh, wow. Nuggets apps. And, of course, right now we're about to get started here with conference play Rams and Buffs. We got watch parties going on for that. If you've already been a member before, you know about the Broncos tailgates, the Nuggets party bus that we have going on. It's only 50 cents now for your first month at dnbr.com. And you get that member sized beer, which almost covers the cost of it in and of itself. Members only Discord, so you can meet other folks that are in our community. You don't have to worry about politics, a holes, things like that. It's fun when you're a member of the DNBR. Com. And now an annual membership actually gets you a free shirt at nbrlocker.com. As I said, it's conference championship time. And if you're ready for the excitement like never before, you can turn your team's victory into your own big win with DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers can bet $5 on any team to win and get $200 in free bets if they do. It's that simple. If, you, if they win, you win. And if Sportsbook is not available in your state just yet, don't fret because you can actually join in on the action with DraftKings Pools. This is where everyone can play for free for the entire month of March, and you had a shot at over $250,000 in prizes with these DraftKings free pools that they have. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code DNVR. You bet just $5 on any college hoops team to win. You get $200 in free bets if they do. Remember, if they win, you win. That's promo code DNVR this week at DraftKings Sportsbook. 
Must be 21 or older. Colorado only. New customers only. Minimum $5 deposit. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. And if you're not down on the corner of Colfax in York at the DNVR bar watching the Nuggets and Avalanche, well, guess what? You can actually watch it in your home with Evoca TV. Yes, E-V-O-C-A dot TV slash DNVR. Go there now. Zero hidden fees or contracts. It's just $25 per month plus receiver. Your price gets locked in for two years. You never have to worry again with Evoca TV where you can enjoy the Nuggets and Avs once again. Seriously. You also get Rapids. You get Mammoth, coverage of CSU Rams, Denver Pioneers. You're going to have the Rockies there all in one place once the Rockies come back, that is. So, evaca.tv slash DNVR. Check that bad boy out. One thing you got to check out that I know everyone's checked out and pretty excited about is something that, that you called. I had a tweet set up, and I don't think it ever ended up going out, unfortunately. But back in, I want to say, November, Drew, we had a show where I pitched that question to you, this idea of bringing back some folks. It was right after Clint Hurdle decided to come back as a special assistant to the GM, and you you threw out all the names, Pedro Stasio, Carlos Gonzalez, Todd Helton. Bring those guys back for spring training. Guess what? The Rockies did. Yeah, and, I, and from what I understand, I, I think Billy Schmidt was was one of the, the um, you know main guys in the thrust behind that. And I think it's awesome. In fact, I was texting with Helton uh, a couple of days ago, and I didn't know at the time that he was um, that he was going down. I had no idea. And he said, "I'm at spring training." And I was kidding him. I go, "You making a comeback?" And um, and and then you know he told me he's working with the minor league guys. Car goes down there. That to me, you saw the tweet I put out. I mean, awesome. I mean, that really made my day. Uh, I think that the Rockies have needed to do a better job of this will be the 30th season it, still a young franchise we understand that but they weren't born yesterday and we have some history uh and, and we've had some you know iconic players and i think to embrace them put your arms around them uh, and, and keep them in the fold and let them know they're always rockies and uh, the cardinals do a marvelous job of that I think the Yankees do a really good job of that. Their organizations, again, that maybe have been around a lot longer and, and have greater history. I understand that. But the Rockies have been around long enough now, and I think this was a great move uh, to bring in a guy like Helton. I mean, even though Walker does stuff with uh, – think about it. Walker does stuff with the Cardinals. He was there for two years. Now, he's been – he yeah. was with the Rockies. He came to spring training. I think it was – was it a year ago? Somewhere in the last couple of years. And, and so – that's that's great, and I'd love to see more of that. Yeah, I think the the list you ran down, I mean, was was a who's who. I mean, even a guy like Juan Pierre, who was only around for about three seasons, but great yeah. value. I mean, knows the game inside and out. And you know, the, the the thing that's I think it's always true of every generation is they might not know the history of the game terribly well. Uh, we had Jason Hirsch on uh, just a couple of days ago in studio. And he was talking about how some of the players, you know, or some of the kids now uh, that come to his camps and, and work with him, you know, don't know that he was a player. But once they learn, oh, you're on the 2007 Rockies, immediately that that opens up a, a big door. And so if you might not know a name like Gerardo Parra, but then you hear about his resume or Juan Pierre, uh, certainly you do know Cargo and, and Helton. But even some of those other guys, Hop, Garrett Atkins, whatever it is, once you hear about what they did, in the big leagues, not that they were just there for a cup of coffee, but the impact that they had, man, that goes a, a really long way in saying, man, I'm, I'm in great hands here with my development, and, and I want to listen to what these guys have to say. And Brad has come back in, talk, in speaking specifically about Hop, and uh, Brad was uh, had, had an opportunity. He came on the podcast not too long ago, and uh, I was speaking with him uh, off uh, off air, so to speak, also, and he'd love to, you know, continue to do more. I mean, Brad works uh, with hitters on the side. He does a lot of different things, but he works with some hitters um, on the side in addition to being a full-time dad. Uh, and, and Sam Hilliard's one of the guys, by the way, uh, you know, a big league talent that he's worked with. So there there are a number of guys, and, and it doesn't just have to be the superstars that, um, you know, matriculated – that that clubhouse uh, there are a lot of people like you mentioned a Juan Pierre that really could add something and I I think it's 
even during the season, if you can bring them around periodically, uh, it, it, it for the fan base, I, I think they enjoy that also. Yes, yeah, Stasio is kind of in that Wampier mold where, again, very, very good, uh, dominant even at times with the, the Rockies. But uh, he's he's kind of a full-time guy. He's going to be down in the Dominican Summer League as a special pitching coach. So, you know, there are going to be some players that uh, – do some a lot more work with him. And so, you know, Jorge De La Rosa, again, another another great guy to to bring back. I don't know if he's officially retired. Uh, we'll kind of wait and see, but, you know, bring him back. He's got just so much knowledge, and it, it's just a, a great community builder to see those guys back. So that that was really exciting. And then you, you even see Helton working with Tolia. So you say, all right, the guy that might be the next kind of Todd Helton, a, a player that you can really rely on for the next five, six years, contract extension. We'll see what happens if he's going to be uh, the next Mr. Rocky and be around for a while. But uh, it's exciting seeing the the past greats along with the uh, the future greats for the Rockies down there in camp. So uh, I'm excited to, to get down there actually next week and uh, rub some elbows with those guys and see them in action. Yeah, I can't wait to – it goes back to our previous conversation. I can't wait to be down there. I mean, this is the time of year, March, spring training – and I and I forget just us. Uh, I've talked to a number of people that are going to spring training and have already made plans, and they want to see games and they want to be able to go to the ballpark on a on a sunny day, whether it's you know here in or, or I should say you know down in Arizona or down in Florida in the Grapefruit League, and you want to see you know businesses that have been impacted start to flourish again because. You know their their establishments are being populated by baseball fans, and they're doing commerce. So, uh, again, fingers crossed that you know in the next whatever it is, eight, ten, twelve, twenty four hours, we can finally put this CBA. BS, you know, I say BS. It's not BS, but you know what I mean. Just we're tired of talking about it, uh, and and put it behind us, and and get to the business of playing baseball and watching the best players in the world participate. It would be nice to have a special code to be able to say, you know, the CBS. This, you know, we're talking about CBA, and it's a bunch of BS. But unfortunately, CBS already stands for something. So yeah, it's and it's not. Time. I mean, I understand both sides' perspective. You're, of course, you're, you're you're splitting up a lot of money. You're yeah. trying to make it equitable. You're trying to make the best deal for your side. I get that. So it's not it's not BS. But from a sure from a, from, from a perspective of an outsider or someone that's impacted, you just want it we're tired of reading about it and and so you just want it behind the sport so the sport now goes out front and i don't want to see any more damage done to the sport absolutely yeah i couldn't couldn't agree with you more one of the other pieces of business that have come out in the past week that's hits right in your wheelhouse new mlb deal with apple tv and nbc that one doesn't get as much coverage the apple tv is the big one valued at 115 million gonna have Friday night baseball on Apple TV plus some marquee games, two games that night, even what was uh, been your, your take on that? I mean, again, it gives an opportunity for more games to be seen by the, the general public and uh, looks like a, to be a pretty good deal. MLB and Apple together. Okay. I like it. The, you know, how, how we consume sports is changing. Amazon is going to pay over $30 million a game. Uh, for Thursday night football, or, or yeah. it's a, you know, it's, it's going to work itself into, you know, billions of dollars. And so that's where we're going. And, and you have to maximize profits if, if you are Major League Baseball or any league and you want your product seen, you want to impress upon the younger generation that you, you know, have something worthy of being consumed and you want to stay on the cutting edge of, of getting your product through streaming, through all these different avenues out to uh, not only the baseball public, but maybe people who had passing interests or as we were chatting about the younger generation and, and bringing them in. So, you know, if you're able to do that while reaping the profits of a deal like Major League Baseball just did with this uh, announcement with Apple, uh, you know, good for them. Yeah, there's going to be a pregame, postgame show, and a, a brand new show called MLB Big Inning 
that, according to the press release, says, quote, live show featuring highlights and look-ins airing every weeknight during the regular season. And so if that's not enough to maybe move the needle, consider that this package uh, for a- a- Apple TV Plus is actually going to uh, be available in Canada as well as Australia, Brazil, Japan, Mexico, Puerto Rico, South Korea, and the United Kingdom. So in that way, you know, I think that could possibly help broaden the base for, for baseball. It just seems like a win-win. And you need to every every sport does, and I think baseball has a has a leg up. Certainly, I would think on American football because American football is played a little bit now in Europe. Uh, you know, it, it's probably got you know some interest down under uh, in Australia, but baseball is played passionately in some of those areas that you mentioned. It's played now more in Europe, uh, but in the far east in japan and korea as we know really big and in and in that doesn't even include latin america as we know so you know basketball's big globally soccer is is enormous right but baseball uh is is in that next tier and to take advantage of that is, is so very important um, you know how <laughs> The, the people watching games now, we just always assume, well, you know, how did the, how did, did a lot of folks in New York or the ratings in New York or the ratings in Cincinnati over the weekend? Well, now it's 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 far more than that. There's you know, there's dollars to be made all over the world. The NBC deal is two years for thirty million dollars. That'll bring Monday night and Wednesday night baseball to NBC. It's not clear yet if it'll be on Peacock. So if you have to have that service, I guess the only downside to this is that if you've got the MLB TV package, it will remove those games. So if it's the two games that are going to be on Friday from Apple, they won't be on the MLB TV. But again, for the health of the game, this definitely uh, is is a really big positive at a time where. Yeah, MLB needs some some good news, and and this was nice to see. I think. It, yes, and the timing of it came out in it's probably to the benefit of the players' association. So wait, there's yeah. another <laughs> deal that just got announced. Wait, <laughs> don't don't tell uh, me things aren't going well. So maybe additional impetus to get this thing you know done today. Absolutely, one thing you got to get done is. Getting some free tickets at AmericanRaptors.com. If you're a huge Colorado sports fan, you probably know everything that is there is to know about the American Raptors. Okay, maybe maybe you don't, but it's it's a rugby club composed of crossover athletes who've played professionally in football, basketball, baseball, wrestling, you name it. And in the quest to win the Rugby World Cup, these future United States national team hopefuls are right here in your backyard, right in Glendale. At Infinity Park. Go to AmericanRaptors.com for your free tickets and check out our very own Colton Strickler on the DNVR Rugby Podcast, dropping every week with info on the basics of rugby while also interviewing the top athletes and coaches in the sport. He's also got excellent betting tips on this year's Super Rugby as well. All that and more at AmericanRaptors.com. Also need to tell you about the relief and recovery creams from Escape Artists. It's the highest awarded topical brand in Colorado that prioritizes quality and consistency. These creams help penetrate for deep muscle tissue discomfort that's fast absorbing. You don't have to worry about it being greasy or staining your clothes or sheets. Nothing like that. Best part is you can find them at your local lightshade dispensary. There's 10, soon to be 11 in the Denver metro area. Lightshade has a premium selection of cannabis concentrates, top shelf flour, edibles, tinctures, accessories, so much more. And now, Podcast listeners, you can get 25% off non-sale items with code DNVR. Shop online at lightshade.com for pickup or visit a Lightshade location near you. Well, Goody, one thing I, I wanted to, to talk about that, that might lead us into uh, our trivia time is something that I'm, I'm surprised I haven't really seen much going around on social media. Uh, it might be because it won't officially go down, if you will, until – this weekend at, at South by Southwest, but it's a new documentary on Nolan Ryan. I don't know if you've heard about this at all. Uh, it's a 105 minute documentary. It's called Facing Nolan, like the title. Uh, as I said, it'll be debuting at South by Southwest. It's it's produced by Nolan uh, and his sons, Reed and Reese Ryan. Uh, it, it features a cast of President George W. Bush is going to be there. Nolan himself, Pudge Rodriguez, Randy Johnson, Rod Carew, 
Dave Winfield, Craig Biggio, George Brett, Roger Clemens, Pete Rose. It's exciting. We need, yeah, we need more baseball documentaries. Yeah, and I go all the way back when I was a you know a wee lad in New York. I remember the 69 Mets is kind of my first, um, I guess, um, remembrances of, of baseball being prominent in my life, coming home from school during the World Series, running in the house and, you know, watching the Miracle Mets uh, with my dad. And Nolan Ryan was on that team. And then Nolan Ryan, who had this unbelievable arm, everybody knew that he just didn't have very much you know, great command. He was traded for Jim Fergozzi, the late Jim Fergozzi, who was a baseball lifer and a really good man and, you know, stayed in baseball uh, until until he passed uh, after his career. But, you know, Nolan Ryan went on to superstardom and and unfortunately the Mets, you know, didn't, uh, you know, didn't get to bear that fruit from his career. But he is somebody that we we've talked so much, Patrick, about Tom Brady, as well we should the last several years and Brady finally retires at 44 and he was still what well, was runner up to, to Rogers and the MVP he was still playing uh, at, at another worldly level well Ryan was the same way man he was strong he threw no hitters in his 40s and still threw harder than anyone else so he is not only the legend but some of the mythology that went along with with Nolan Ryan Jeff Houston. Uh, one of my partners, uh, you know, tells a great, great story about the first time he was traded to Texas and in spring training, he's facing Ryan. And it was, uh, he came up like, you know, it was just a handful of hitters, you know, his simulated game. So it's not, you're not waiting nine turns, you know, it was like three hitters. And he said the first time up, he like, he had a base hit against him. Then he hit a triple against him and, He's, he's like, you he can't believe it. He's having, you know, this unbelievable success against Nolan Ryan. And so like the fourth time he came up, he's like, I mean, he's like three for three against Nolan Ryan in the simulated game. The fourth time he came up, Ryan, Ryan looked in at him and he said, how many hits do you have, kid? And Jeff said, none. He said, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> That was that was what to, that was the first time they met, and Jeff went on to become very good friends with with Nolan and with the Ryan family. I've met Reed on several occasions because of Huey, uh, but I, I always I always loved that story. And, uh, and in fact, Huey, on aside, played behind Nolan in his sixth and seventh no hitters. He that was good stuff. Well, that 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 story had a better ending than I, I thought. I really uh, imagined it was going to be. You know, fastball to the ribs. You know, yeah. That, that well, back. Huey was Huey was worried about that. My and guy, so he was like, "I don't have any hits." <laughs> so, wow, yeah, great answer. Yeah, he's he's. You're right. I think that's a good comparison, and, and I think that's where this documentary is going to come in. Is you know, you hear his name, and you know he has the most strikeouts all time, but no Cy Young awards, and you go, "Oh, all right. Well, you know, what, what was going on with that?" And you know, there walked a lot of guys, but for how long he was able to do it as successfully as he did. And the seven no hitters too, which is something you think about, you know, as, as a number that could possibly never be approached again and how he was just able to do it that late into his career. I think Mark Knutson, you know, one of our Denver guys, when he played with them coming up in Houston, he couldn't keep up with them. And he was in his late thirties by that point, Ryan. Yeah. So Matt massively strong, lower half. Yeah. I mean, really big, strong legs and, you know, from Alvin, Texas and tough, uh, but, you know, a gentleman and he never really lost his fastball. You know, some guys, Patrick, we always talk about this. I have to, you know, reinvent themselves. Zach Greinke for one, Zach Greinke used to throw hard and he's reinvented himself. He has, you know, one of the two or three lowest average fastballs in baseball, but he's still very effective. Nolan Ryan never really had to reinvent himself. I mean, he he had the power arm. What many people who've just heard about him or maybe didn't witness his career may not realize, yes, he had a big, big arm. He also had one of the best curveballs of all time. He really did. He could really spin a curveball. So I think whenever we think of Ryan, we think of the Ryan Express. But Nolan Ryan had a great, great hook. 
I'm glad you mentioned that because there's not very many ball players who have a team named after them. Again, minor league team, but Cal Ripken, we got the Aberdeen Ironbirds, and you got the Round Rock Express. I mean, that's that's a that's a name to to live on, you know, forever. And it also helps when you own the club. You know, I I, I was gonna say that yes, uh, but you got to have a good nickname too to to go along. Yeah, with that. Yeah, you know, well. We'll see if, if you ever, you know, start a team in, in like Glendale, the good boys or the good men. Oh, that could, good men. That I, could like play. That. I like that. That could work. Why, yeah. Why, why Glendale? How did that roll off your, t- I like alliterations, you know, oh, the G and the G Glendale, good men. Right. You know, I mean, it's Denver area, but you know, I like, I like alliterations. All right. So Listen, the- <laughs> you're, you're giving me ownership. I'm all in. Why not? Exactly. Right. Now, the, the description of the documentary is as such. I'll, I'll read it verbatim here uh, on, on the documentary's website. It says, Nolan Ryan's numbers tell a story, but numbers alone do not capture his essence. Flashpoints have emblazoned him onto our subconscious, like pitching with his jersey covered in blood, running a cattle ranch during the offseason, the iconic brawl where Ryan walloped the 20 years younger Robin Ventura, despite mythical moments and statistical brilliance, Ryan's career is a study in extremes. Not only does he hold the record for most walks and most wild pitches, but he's also given up the most grand slams and the most stolen bases. Many of today's baseball analysts don't consider him to be among the greats. With all that in mind, where does Ryan fit in the ever-evolving game of baseball? Are you flying into Austin tonight to get tickets to this thing or what? It sounds great. It sounds great. Um <laughs> And Austin's a good town. Uh, yeah, I wish I was going. I th- it, it sounds like it's going to be awesome. And, and it just shows you, too, that we're so consumed, I feel, sometimes by, like, the last year or two, you always hear, he's the GOAT. That guy's the GOAT. He's yeah. the GOAT. He's the GOAT. I mean, that's fine to have those conversations, but there's a lot of – there's a lot of people that made their mark and may not go down as the all-time greatest or even one of the handful of greatest, but because of how they did it and when they did it, they enter a, you know, a, a room of their own. And Ryan has a room of, of his own. I don't think anybody that knows baseball would sit here and say, yes, Nolan Ryan's one of the three or four or five greatest pitchers of all time. He had – in terms of powerful stuff, you could probably put him in that grouping of, of, you know, just a handful of guys and the seven no hitters would, would be exhibit a, but he still is in a room by himself because of the seven, no hitters, because of the intimidation factor, because of the length of his career uh, and, and, you know, so many other things that occurred during the 20 some odd years that he played, including when, uh, you know, a young and talented Robin Ventura thought he would go out to the mound and turned out to be a really bad idea. That's one of my all time favorite clips. Yeah. Cause you can, I th- you can see what's going on inside his head. Once he gets hit, his back turns and he's thinking about it. And then his head dips and he goes, all right, I, I got to do it. I mean, I'm gonna go. he was coming, but he had to go. To your point, I think I think Ryan, as you said, all-time greatest, no. But he's in that all-time class or number one for this generation, perhaps, for being revered. It It's kind of similar to like music people that go, oh, the Beatles are the greatest band of all time. Okay, very influential too. But Velvet Underground is one of those bands that most people probably might not even know any of their songs. You could probably play some of their best hits and, and you might not know it, but they are – revered as a band that launched a thousand bands where they just were so inspirational. And I think, again, when you see the list of people, I mean, Roger Clemens is that guy where he, Ryan was that to Roger Clemens where, you know, Clemens might be that to the younger generation of, of players that we've, we've just seen come up through the ranks or are playing now. And Ryan was that guy for Clemens and still probably is for a lot of people too. He's just revered. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you another one that, you know, Ryan, you think of seven, you think of the power pitching and you think of the seven no hitters. I don't think anyone's going to ever put Cal Ripken among the greatest players ever. Now he's a Hall of Famer and so is Nolan Ryan. So I'm not trying to disparage their career. They were great. They were phenomenal. But how Ripken did it and the Iron Man 
streak and the fact that here was a shortstop that wasn't, you know, Buddy Harrelson, who I grew up watching with the Mets, or, you know, Larry Boa, who's still in the game, and, you know, these 5'9", 5'10", scrappy, 160-pound guys that, you know, would hit one home run a season and, you know, hit 240 but pick it really well and could run a little bit. I mean, then it spawned the 6'3", shortstop who was 200 plus pounds trevor story who you know we've you know seen in colorado alex rodriguez there's you know everyone i mean corey seager six five for for goodness sake so he had a huge impact on the game beyond whatever the statistics said and, and so that's why i kind of tried to make an analogy to the impact that ryan had on on power pitching i like that yeah that, i mean that, I think that's a perfect example about changing the game, as you said. And Ryan did that with his, his workouts, obviously, and uh, and really bringing in that that fastball, which, you know, we're, we're only seeing now finally get to that point where you, you've got to have that kind of gas. But but Ripken did, as you said, for the tall guys. I, I'm trying to think of who else. Because, you know, you've got players that are just almost freaks of nature where you go, hey, Randy Johnson, fantastic. But you can't teach someone to go out and say, like, oh, man, I want to be 6'10". No, you, you're not going to be able to do that. But you could look at Nolan and say, "All right, well, if I've got that kind of work ethic, you know, maybe I can, I can be successful into my mid 40s." You know, and just again, the, as you said, the way he went about his business is so interesting. I'm kind of curious, like what it, this made me think before we jump into any of our trivia here. Um, but it made me think, like, okay, well, what's a good Rockies documentary that we would like to see? And again, you know, there's the the documentary on the 2007 Rockies, which is um, you know, fantastic. And, and, and we like that, but there's always more stories out there. I feel like you can go back and make something of with, with my guest on, on Wednesday's podcast, Joel Milholm, we kind of talked about, you know, some research she's doing about how the Rockies came about and how all these different communities in Denver needed to sign off and approve different things and how the voters, you know, voted for the, the tax to go up. And so it feels like there's a lot behind the scenes in that and in, in the 1985 CBA when they first said, hey, expansion would be coming. And in Colorado Senator, Senator Tim Worth creating a congressional task force to investigate baseball expansion. Like there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that we probably don't know of how close it could have been that Denver didn't get the Rockies. And that's just a fascinating topic for me that I, I think I, I wouldn't mind seeing a documentary on just leading up to that, that first pitch there in Queens, in New York, Dwight Gooden, great. But what happened before that to actually get to that? Because so much work was put in. Yeah, I, I think that would be fascinating. And um, before I give you one of my um, one of the things I recall about that that time frame, we did a documentary. I say we. I, I can't remember in 07 if we were still Fox Sports then or or we had become Root Sports. I think we were probably still Fox. But I, I'm pretty sure we were Fox Sports back then. And, and you can probably get this place is still we did a I thought a really well done documentary. I know that sounds like a shameless plug, but for Rockies fans, it's a must 21 days, which right. documented, you know, the remarkable run at the end of the year to the postseason. And then the fact that the Rockies went unbeaten to go to, the, you know, on their way to the World Series. And then they had nine days off. And we know what happened against against the Red Sox. But uh, that was that's a really fun documentary recounting from players' perspectives and other people's perspectives what transpired over those 21 days. Uh, going back to the origin of, of how the Rockies came to be, the thing I always recall was it, it really appeared baseball was hell-bent on they were going to South Florida. They were going to South Florida if you and I owned the damn team, right? And then it was, what's the other city going to be? And there was internal pushback from Major League Baseball on, there was skepticism on Denver. Man, it's cold there, right? Not knowing our climate fully. Um, it's going to snow there all the time. Uh, you know, it's at altitude and... So the requirements were, th there were some non-negotiable things, allegedly. And one was you had to have a baseball-only stadium. 
And so finally, because the whole community just overwhelmed Major League Baseball with, you know, we're deserving a Major League Baseball. Every, every, every qualification, our area met and exceeded by tenfold. It took years in South Florida for them to actually finally get a baseball only stadium in downtown Miami. It took, what was it? A couple of decades or a yeah. decade and a half. And, and immediately, you know, we played at mile high for two years. Construction began right away and course field opened the, you know, beautiful facility in 1995. So everything that Colorado did, they did perfectly. And there was still pushback that, Colorado, you know, shouldn't get that franchise, et cetera. And we know from an attendance standpoint, immediately they broke every attendance record in the history of baseball, and even now through some poor seasons, right? And, and, and other things, the Rockies draw exceptionally well. And not to point a finger at South Florida, but it's been a massive struggle, even though they've won a couple of World Series, it's been a massive struggle from a business standpoint and from a stadium standpoint and from drawing fans uh, down there. And those two teams will, will forever be joined at the hip because they both arrived in 1993. And one, and one was like, it's a fait to complete. They're yeah. getting a baseball team. And the other one was, uh, man, they keep passing every test. I guess we have to give them one. Yeah, I've been, I've been hearing even like a conversation, which again, I don't necessarily pay too much attention to the Marlins. You got to know a little bit about everyone, but someone saying eh, the ballpark wasn't really put in the right neighborhood. They might need to, you know, put one elsewhere. I'm like, you, what the, the, this brand new stadium, you're saying there's, we already know there's been a mistake and it's like, and, and it's almost like you're giving them another chance. I'm like, actually, if you move it 10 blocks this way, I think now you're just going to get, you know, millions more every single year. It's come on. But yeah, that, that's what I'm fascinated in, you know, Coors field in March of, of was it 1991 when they, break ground and, and they choose 20th and Blake as that site and how I know from, you know, team historian, Paul Parker saying the discussion was where's home plate going to be. And so you might even know some of this too, but it was either going to be where it is now, you know, there on the corner of, of 20th and Blake or where the rock pile is out, out in center field so that it opens up to the mountains and you could see it a little bit more clearly. But obviously when you're talking about foot traffic, that's, that's by the train line. I mean, there's an overpass there. There's going to be zero foot traffic at home plate. So they kind of, you know, made that sacrifice, so to speak. And it was a pretty damn good choice. And again, those are all the, those are the stories that we do know. How many stories exist out there that we don't know? Well, I'll give you another example. You yeah. take Miami and I've, I've been to that stadium, you know, many, many, many times. Uh, and, it, and it's basically on the side of the old orange bowl. And it, hasn't changed that neighborhood dramatically and if you don't know miami it's it's not in downtown miami where coors field is in downtown denver and coors field as anybody that has spent any amount of time knows in our area coors field completely changed the city of denver not just lodo i mean it changed lodo dramatically because those were warehouses and you know, places you, you probably wouldn't wander um, at, at all, not just in the evening. Uh, but it changed it changed the whole dynamic of the city of Denver. And there are cities that people work in and then there's a mass exodus at five o'clock. And there are other cities where there's a vibrancy to, you know, we know Manhattan, for instance, is always going to be a great vibrancy, even though there's no stadiums. Uh, in Manhattan, but Denver is a vibrant city and has people who, who ton of people who live downtown and, and, you know, great restaurants and museums and galleries and a baseball stadium right there. And, you know, adjacent to downtown, just a couple of blocks, obviously is ball arena where, where the nuggets and avalanche play. So it changed, it changed more than, the course of the history of the Rockies and the course of people's adoration of baseball in the Rocky mountain region, it changed a city with the building of Coors Field. And you also got to remember when the Rockies came, this was only a two team town. 
So that, you know, how much does that impact potentially the Nordiques moving to Colorado? I, I, again, that's, that's well, all part of that work to, that's all part of that conversation of, as you said, to your point, not just, Hey, what does it mean for baseball? What does it mean for the city of Denver as a whole? Or the city it, of it just, it, Patrick, to your point, it's a wonderful one. It legitimizes. I know we work in sports and I know there's people who believe it or not, who could care less about sports. However, even if you don't lo- care about sports, it's not your thing. It just legitimizes you as a big time city when you can go, yep, NBA, NFL, NHL, MLB, not to mention soccer, uh, you know, the MSL. So when people go, okay, what are the major cities? Denver is a major city in the United States. It's not, well, they have one team or they have two teams, as you were stating, you know, 30 plus years ago. They got every team. And and that's part of when you start, you know, checking off things on what makes a, a city, you know, kind of a, a big time attraction. You know, that that's somewhere on the list. All right. I, all right. I think I found a co-producer here. I, I got you excited about this, this project here. We'll see. Yeah. One, one of the stories that I, I just happened to see at one point, again, going back to the idea of how many stories we don't know was one, I, I'm not sure when it was shared. It might've even been this off season, but example of it is former GM of the Cubs. And you might even know this story, Ed Lynch. He was talking about the 95 draft and how with the Cubs, I think they were sitting with the third or the fourth pick and they wanted Kerry Wood, but the Mariners were thinking of taking Kerry Wood with the third pick. They didn't, um, but thought was already, well, Kerry Wood goes, we're going to go ahead and take Todd Helton with the fifth overall pick. Well, sure enough, uh, Jose Cruz gets gets taken by the Mariners, and so Cubs get Wood. Helton's available for the Rockies, but it was that close where the Mariners do their thing, butterfly effect. It it, it changes the history of the franchise. Todd Helton would have been a Cub, and you go, wow, it was really that close. It's it's well, that wild. It was also very close. Todd was a second round pick of the Padres out of high school out of Knoxville Central, and and he was very close to signing with the Padres. And he went to his grandmother's house, I'm trying to recollect the story, to try to get away. And he was close with the Padres. I don't know if it was the area scout or, you know, somebody hot, fairly high up the food chain uh, that he that he really liked. And, and it, w- it, it was close, but, you know, he as we know, he opted to go try to play both football, and he did football and baseball uh, at at Tennessee. But you know, th- those those are always fun stories. You know, the woulda, coulda, shoulda, how things you know work out, right? All right, let's see if I can pull this off. Todd Helton could have had a career as a pro football player there. University of Tennessee gets banged up. His backup Peyton Manning comes in. Great career. Broncos swing a trade for him, win a Super Bowl, and now here we are. And they may have done it again with former Rockies minor leaguer Russell Wilson. Uh, that's pretty exciting. You know, it's re- it's not pretty exciting. I, I, I'm going to go a couple notches above it. It's really exciting, Patrick. It's it really exciting. Um, I've lived here a long time, and I I pull for the Broncos. I'm a died in the wool New York Giant fan, but I live here. I'm a Coloradan, and, and I always want to see the Broncos do well. Um, I was on. Uh, 104.3, the fan, part of my three-year run there, uh, midday, and, and Hastings and I, Scott Hastings and I, w- would do a daily, uh, you know, kind of routine, uh, you know, all in fun, but you're trying to get Manning, you know, to, to come to Denver, right? And obviously he did, and, and what a wonderful ride that was, and now Manning's part of part of our community right he's made his home here and and maybe he'll be part of the new ownership group Uh, i'm hopeful he is in some way shape or form part of the new ownership group Uh, and now russell wilson is is coming to town and i think that is awesome because it's been a while before since people were really excited uh about what was going on at the valley Uh, and and you see pieces and court von miller had a great run here and but it's been a while and and we know listen we 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 work in baseball i I do things in football and and basketball as well but the broncos will always be number one 
there will always be this yeah. will always be a pro football town number one and russell wilson coming here uh, is right up there you know may, maybe you put it a notch you know half a notch below peyton manning though he's going to play in all likelihood barring injury knock on wood longer than peyton was because he's, he's younger um, you know elway was a different situation you know, Elway hadn't played a down yet in the NFL. He was this you know, huge time prospect out of Stanford. Colts could he didn't want to play for the Colts. But you know, who knows? There's been a lot of great prospects that that didn't become great players. John Elway became a great, great player. We know that. This is this is big time, man. This is big time. And I'll, I'll share a quick, you know, story. I'm going to repeat it. I'm sure this week on my podcast about about Russell Wilson, but this is a unique leader. And we've seen that now because he's, you know, one of the most famous football players in the NFL. This is a unique leader and the Rockies realized that, you know, early on. So this, this is, this is good stuff, man. They finally coming home to Denver after being drafted in 2010 and I, I, with yeah. Rockies, but I'll still be in Denver. Yeah. And I know I, his rights are still held because the Rangers had him for a little bit. And they, what is, is the Yankees hold the rights? Yankees. Yes. But you know, Patrick, you and I are going to be standing out there batting practice one day and then Russell yeah. Wilson and, and there'll be, you know, a little entourage come out there and he'll take BP. He'll be a course field. He loves baseball. You know, he's going to jump right on board and, uh, especially because of, as you said, he's got a history with this organization. And it's kind yeah, of more of a ceremonial attachment now to the Yankees. It's not like he's going to be, you know, running to Trenton and playing, you know, minor league baseball for the Yankees. I think I think pretty much know what he does, uh, you know, Monday through Friday or Monday, yeah. Sunday through Saturday, whatever you want to say. Uh, maybe, maybe the Rockies try to reacquire him. We'll see. They they, they need some good news. Broncos in the, uh, got the headlines for getting yeah. Wilson. Today, as we record this on Wednesday, you know, they part ways uh, with their their head of analytics, Scott Van Lenten. So optics, not not great for for the Rockies, but good for the city of Denver overall. And again, once we get baseball back, people's tunes will, will change. I think. Yeah, just a bit. let me let me throw something else out there. I haven't, by the way, I have no idea what what transpired with with uh, Van Lenten, who, right. you know, wasn't here very long. But um, in the in the case of the cba which we've started every show with for weeks on end right have we uh, yeah i guess maybe no we we have it. i mean you you yeah, but you no you, well we, no we actually have it's just yeah, yeah it's what's going on right but one thing we haven't mentioned today patrick is that let's say they they get the damn thing done again fingers crossed all the same things we've been doing and saying sometime later today right the feeding frenzy patrick starts the yeah. free agent there's over 300 names out there. Now, some are, you know, smaller names, but there's a lot of big names out there. Right. The Rockies, you know, need in a perfect wor world more than one bat, you know. So it's going to be fascinating for whatever, you know, 48, 72 hours because guys aren't going to wait. They want to know where they're going. It's not going to be you know, these negotiations and flirtations, just kind of be like, this is the best deal. I'm taking it. Boom. Done. Packing yep. my bags and I'm heading to Scottsdale, packing my bags. I'm heading to Jupiter, Florida, wherever it is. Right. And if they already have a place in, in Phoenix, maybe you get, maybe you get a good deal, a little one year contract for someone. He said, Oh, didn't think we could get this guy, but under the circumstances, what do you know? The last time this happened, Bill Swift, Larry Walker, I've said it a million times. So you, you never know what, what can happen. You're right. It'll, the feeding frenzy will be be really, really exciting. All right, here's yeah. your trivia before we we plug away on the Drew Goodman podcast. I happened to get a random email last night. I get I get these trivia emails from Sabre about, again, just, just trivia, and you got to find the link between all the players. And it was about Randy Johnson having 212 games of 10 strikeouts or more. I go, wow, that that's a lot. Uh, and the only one player has more than him. And it's our guy, Nolan Ryan. After that, those guys are one and two. After that, you almost have to go half as many. So I'm just curious. I just have like the top five guys. Okay. Or, or, or if you got even the top Rockies players who <laughs> have 10 or more strikeout games. Okay. Let me, let me go on the all time list. Let me see how I do. Roger Clemens. 
Number three with 110. So almost half as many as Randy Johnson. That's that's bonkers. But yeah, number three, Roger Clemens. My guy growing up, the the, the late great Tom Terrific, Tom Seaver. He's number 12 on the list with 70. He's 12. Oh man. Yeah. Steve Carlton. Steve Durango Carlton. resident. He's eight. He's eighth with 84. There's only there are two players active that are ahead of Tom Seaver at 12. And there's two right behind him. But <laughs> it's interesting because again, if you think of the all-time list of greatest pitchers, it doesn't exactly line up with strikeouts and performance of those strike. Like Cy Young is I don't even know where he is on this list. Yeah, you know, guys like Christy Matthewson, but the strikeout wasn't as, you know, wasn't as prominent. I, I did I did a search for Young. He he never even had eight games of huh. 10 or more strikeouts. Cy Young didn't strike out then. They were throwing That's 77 crazy. miles an hour. That's true. Um, <laughs> I don't, I'm trying to think. Wow. Bob Gibson, where's Gibson on that list? He's at 11 with 74. Sam McDowell, I don't think you would have. You Sudden would have Sam tried. McDowell. He's tied. With with Gibson there, also at seventy four. Here's a name I don't think it would be up there because uh, you know he kind of his career got derailed. But I was watching an MLB his, his no hitter against Seattle, kind of later in his career with the Yankees. But he struck out a lot of guys for a while. Is Doc Gooden? No, I don't see him in the top yeah. twenty. Yeah, that wouldn't again. Twenty ninth, twenty ninth. Yeah, six. Hall, right, of so fame, Hall of Fame talent. Unfortunately, you know he. You know, he had some issues that got in the way. Um, I was surprised to see at number sixteen, although or tied for tied for fifteenth. And I I loved him growing up. I I have a poster of him actually, and I think he's criminally underrated. David Cohn, fifty nine games, yeah, ten or more Cone. strikeouts. How about how about Louisiana Lightning? Ron Guidry is he on the list somewhere? Gator, I don't see him in the top twenty five. A's eighty fifth with twenty three. Oh wow! So I'm not that why they're bringing up okay. active. Active players just behind Seaver uh, at 13 and 14. Verlander with 68. Kershaw, we'll put an asterisk next to the active, with 65. Chris Sale, 78. He's ninth all time. How about that? Yeah. That, uh, that was a little surprising. Right, so, so I didn't get four and five. Give me a couple of quick hints. So all people right. are bored to death with this. Uh, Fourth exercise. and fifth are both the only two other guys over 100. Um, one of them, I, I don't know all of the members of his family, but you might say he has an uncle named Steve, uh, at least after this off season. These are the kind of clues I give when we do tacos or tears. Tears, come on, break it down. Uncle Steve, off season, active player. My brain's dead. Uncle Steve. Uncle Steve's on the Twitter box again. Yeah, Stephen A. Cohen. Oh, Mad, Mad Max. Yeah, that's it. Mr. He's Mad four? Max. Four. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. It was surprising yeah. seeing him that high. And then the last one, uh, he's got a gig with Fox. No, no, he actually is. No, I don't know if he's on Fox. He's definitely on the MLB network. Uh, did pitch oh. with the Mets also. Briefly. Wait, wait, say the last part again. Uh, he did play with the Mets, Phillies, oh, wow. but you know him mostly as – a Boston Red Sox, Dodgers, Expos, but mostly with the Red Sox. Ninety-nine All-Star Game, struck out five guys in a row. Probably about five foot ten, Dominican Republic. Oh, Pedro, yeah, gosh, that's terrible of me. I did, I did a hard. I've been good on your no, trivia. No. I did a terrible job today. No, you didn't. Koufax, ninety-seven games, which I, that's also pretty impressive too. Because again, it was Koufax sixth. Very short career, yeah. Think, think about think about that one. He yeah. he retired at thirty. Yeah, that's he impressive. retired at thirty. Schilling seventh with ninety three. So yeah, only only five guys, harder ten to, or more strikeouts, and, and harder to do now. Tip of the cap to Max Scherzer, right? Uh, harder to do now. I think so. We know that, you know somebody's somebody's coming to get the baseball in the sixth inning typically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say it's harder to do because the strikeout, you know, the strikeout rate is higher than it's ever been, 
but we also pull the base, take the baseball away from the starting pitcher earlier than ever before. In the top, on the one hand, it's easier. On the other hand, it's more difficult. Sure. In the top 200, you've got the guys that are t- tied for first for the Rockies. 15 apiece for John Gray and Pedro Stasio. 15, 10, or 10 strikeouts or more. And then tied for second, or actually tied for third, Ubaldo and Herman Marquez with 10 each. Yeah, and, and Herman will, my guess is, so. be number one on that list at some point in the not-too-distant future. Um, That's right. I was recounting with somebody the Ubaldo story, um, you know, that, that 2010 season for someone not too long ago, just how dominant it was. Sure. That, it wasn't, that it wasn't just, boy, this guy's really had a nice, you know, first three months of the season for the Colorado Rockies. Boy, he's an all-star. That's great. He's starting the all-star game. Great. Good for him. I mean, it was historically great. It was historically great, regardless of whether he played in Denver or L.A. or New York or anywhere in between. Yeah, I don't know if I'll ever see anything like it, just because he was on another planet. He was on another planet during that time. But on this planet and on your podcast, Bill Hansley is going to be on. Long time. Yeah, Bill, that launches tomorrow, and hopefully, you know, at the outset, we're talking about the CBA being done and and get into that and there's some other things i'm going to get into this week but uh you know bill's an old friend bill's been in town he's had a huge impact not not just you know on the basketball side of things but starting gold crown with ray baker who's instrumental by the way in getting course field built getting uh you know the 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 home of the broncos built the new home of the broncos built uh, so he's had a huge impact on the community. But we talk some old stories for, for people who followed the Nuggets through the years. We we go back and tell some old stories uh, you know, about Doug Moe in the 80s. And, and we get into Nikola Jokic and, and the impact he's had and, and what we're witnessing. So a lot of stuff that we cover with Hanslick. A lot of funny stories also because he played for Digger Phelps at Notre Dame. Uh, so uh, the, the it, you're going to be entertained. It's good stuff. That was my next question about about Digger. I wasn't sure if they had if Hans looking him had 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 overlap there. Oh yeah, that's what we played for. And they were some like good. Yeah, and yeah, he was drafted and, and went to Seattle for a couple of years, and and then and then he came here. Some of the for people who go back with the Nuggets and and remember fondly as as I think most people do, Doug Moe, There are some classic stories, and I know you were back in Jersey, and for a minute, Doug was in Philadelphia, coaching the Sixers. And he's he if you put it this way, Patrick, if you put together all of the great characters in the history of Denver sports near the top. And I don't mean character. That's not saying like he's a goofball or whatever. Personalities. Personalities. That's a better way of putting it, Um, because Doug was a heck of a coach. I mean, you know, his victories are up in the in the rafters as as it should be. And one of my all-time favorite people. But Doug, in terms of personalities, all-time in Denver, he's on a short list, man. He really is. He's on a short list. And um, he, he was he was beautiful. He was beautiful. Patrick, he, just to give you a little tease, and you can go back because I know how studious you are. You'll go back and do some homework on him. When the game started, he had this is back before you know when everybody was dressed to the nines. Well, that was not Doug's thing. He was like the anti Pat Riley. So he had a jacket and a tie on, probably because it was required. By a minute 15 into the first quarter, the jacket was askew, the tie was ripped down to here, and that may not even last the whole first quarter. And that was virtually every night. He was an inspiration for Bill Belichick, is what you're saying. Very well could have been, as yeah, far as the, the stock. The hoodie. <laughs> Minus the hoodie. But, he, but, but Belichick took it to the next level. But he saw Doug Moe and said, Yeah, but, but Bill keeps it together for the most part on the sideline, right? Yeah. I mean, Doug was a whirling dervish. And, you know, as I think I said on the podcast, he could make sailors blush with his language. But he had a switch. He truly did. When when the game was over, he flipped the switch and he became he went from a madman to the nicest human being you'll ever meet. So I'm excited to not only just listen to this 
conversation with Bill Hanslick. But I'm also excited for when it does drop on Thursday morning. See if it has that little red E next to it for explicit. Does he go <laughs> off? Uh, I got I got two things I'm excited for now. No, because Bill, because Bill, you know, you know, I can, you know, hang in there with the best of them when it comes <laughs> to colorful language. Uh, Bill, you know, Bill, Bill's not that guy. So I, you know, we, but it's fun. We have a lot of, there's a lot of good Mo stories in there also. All right. Since you know the Nuggets really well, well, this will be the last thing. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of love, got a lot of hate the other day. Actually, I think it was Monday morning. So it was even before another great game from Jokic. I said, Nikola Jokic, greatest individual player in Denver sports history. Now it's vague, but at the same time, individual being the key word, he's at a point now where he, look, he's obviously in the conversation. I don't think it's a slam dunk, no pun intended, but if he goes and wins back-to-back MVPs, I mean, that is elite of elite, still a short career, still has a way to go. But if you just, you just talk about dominance right now as an individual player, basketball allows for it more than any other sport. He's number one in Denver history. I don't think it's as, if people, you know, can back off the, the Elway bandwagon for a moment. And John deserves to be in that conversation. Elway is always one of the all time greats. So I'm not disparaging, you know, what he did and what he accomplished. Nikola Jokic is 27. And again, we talked about this earlier, the Broncos will always be number one in town. And when the Bron- and when the other teams are doing well, you know, they, they move up in the, uh, stature for a period of time within the community you know the Rockies saw that with rocktober in 07 and again in 09 you know more recently in 17 and 18 but the broncos are always up here now having said that if, if you just break it down what you said patrick and i'm not just having your back because you're my boy i mean it's not as far it's not far-fetched your presentation and and bill and i talk about it from a nuggets perspective on the podcast because the Nuggets have had some great, great players and great talent. You know, going back to Issel and David Thompson and, you know, there's been some English. really good – Well, yeah, and then Alex English in the 80s. I, I believe Alex scored more points than anybody in the, in, in the NBA in the 80s and probably really should have been among the top 75 players of all time. I mean, Alex was, was remarkable. Fat Lever was an underrated uh, player in Denver. You know, but to your thing, then you get into some of the Avalanche guys. Who's Joe Sakix? An all Sakic's the one. Sakic's the one that works an all time. Yeah. Um, but you know, he he battled so many injuries. You know, but Joe Sakic. It's it's a it's a it's a nice debate, but you're not you're not off base at all throwing him in there, Jokic. Not at all. That gold medal, man. It, it was, I hope he listen. Yeah. He's having a better year this year. And we know Murray's been out. We know Porter's been out. That's the thing. Yes. He's having a better year this year by every measurement, including all the advanced analytics. Some of the advanced analytics, it should be a slam the gavel down. He's the MVP of the league this year. And I'm telling you, and you know this, Patrick, you and I are both from the, from New York, New Jersey area, right? If he's in New York, if he's in LA, if he's even in Miami with the Heat, they're like, no, Jokic is the MVP. On, but on Denver, yeah. it was quaint that he won it last year. The Nuggets have come on of late. You know, they're they're good. Are they going to get Murray back soon? Does Porter coming back? You know, those are the question marks. He's the damn MVP. I forget he's where MVP. I forget where I heard this, but I've heard it a couple times. Every MVP. Actually, it was Mark Knudsen. I think I, I, I'm a good memory. Every MVP in the NBA is in the Hall of Fame. So he's already a Hall of Famer right now. Lock it in. It's already done. And he was second-round pick. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad. This has yeah. been fun, Goody. I'm always, on, always, looking always. For, looking for this conversation with Bill Hanslick Thursday morning when it drops, as always. I mean, I subscribe, so I don't even have to think about it. It just comes in right there, and I get to listen to it first thing in the morning. Love it. Yeah, no, I, no, I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate you guys pumping it, uh, pumping it up. And uh, I think the last week actually, cause we had, and it's still, uh, you can always get anyone, but with Spilly and, and Huey on and kicking around 
uh, all this, you know, the MLB lockout stuff. Uh, we we had more downloads this last week uh, than than ever before. So kind of proud of that, and, and appreciate everybody listening and and checking it out. And you guys uh, for for spreading the good word, man. Baseball fans are are getting hyped about baseball, even though we don't have it. Yeah, we've we've seen similar numbers kind of start to go through the roof here a little bit. So it's, yeah, it's, I know, I know, I know. DNBR is kicking butt and everything. Congrats to DNBR now in Chicago, also, man. Great CFGO. stuff. Geo, yeah. yeah, great stuff. Yeah. It's fun. Now I got some more baseball people to talk to. Got to have a a four corners uh, wrestling match with with Phoenix Cubs and White Sox in Chicago. Man, hey, if, if when you do that, include me. I want in. You can be the referee. You, you yeah. got to wear the striped shirt. You know, okay. you can throw the questions out at us. Maybe make it fair so it's not too one-sided. There you go. There you That's go. That's it. All right, Drew Goodman Podcast again Thursday morning on Twitter at Drew Goodman 42 I'm at Patrick D. Lyons on Twitter. And all our great Rockies content is at DNVR underscore Rockies. Now only 50 cents for your first month at the DNVR.com. This has been a blast as always. But you know what they say about momentum. It's only as good as next next week's show and tomorrow's show it's only as good it's it's all ravel it's all unraveling yeah what, what's See, my phrase yeah it's as we as we like to say it's only as good as tomorrow's podcast right mm-hmm.